Uh, good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar from CHBC Education Chapter. I'm Steve Gordon, and I lead the outreach effort. Today, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Johnston and, and Benjamin to talk about their uh, work in South Africa. So without further ado, Brian, you want to take over? Thanks so much. Presumably, you can see my screen. Yes? Yes, go ahead. Okay, cool. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I'll be talking briefly about the HPC Ecosystems Project and how we've taken advantage of online education to support the system administrator training that we do for HPC system administrators. But just very brief background about me. I started off as an HPC recipient when I worked at a local university in South Africa and I was principal technician responsible for running the system and supporting the academic research on the system. Uh, and this is part of the actual project that I now lead. When I was a recipient, we received one of the systems from the project. I'll explain very briefly about the, what the nature of the project is. Uh, and now I am the lead of this ecosystems project and I work inside the advanced computer engineering lab in the center for high performance computing. And just a bit of uh, relevant information for the context of how we developed our training. I completed the Masters of Science in Computer Science course um, through the Georgia Tech Online Masters in Computer Science program, which at least at the time, I believe it still is the largest online master's program uh, in the world. Um, and I learned a lot of lessons from that that helped to influence how we developed our online training. Um, and if you ever do send me an email, please remember it's Brian with a Y. Uh, I've already been born with two eyes, so I don't need a third. Uh, if anyone isn't aware where South Africa is, it's at the south of Africa, and Cape Town is on that little tip over there. And I work for the Center for High Performance Computing. We have a lot of really creative names in South Africa. So we are the National Supercomputing Facility in South Africa. Um, fairly recently, we fell out the top 500, but we, we were debuted at uh, position 123 on the top 500. And we are, for most intents and purposes, the largest HPC system in Africa, although your mileage may vary depending on what you're trying to do. There are other facilities, but they're not national supercomputing facilities. We focus primarily on the South African academic institutes and research facilities, and also more broadly, the Southern African community partners, which are on the left here. Oh, actually, sorry, they're on the right. The green are the Southern African region. And on the left is a square kilometer array partner countries, which includes East and West Africa partner countries. The square kilometer array is the largest radio astronomy telescope project in the world uh, with a large consortium internationally that supports it. And it was at the time of its uh, inception going to be the, the primary demand for exascale computing. So very briefly on the ecosystems project here, we actually take decommissioned tier one supercomputing facility systems that are being decommissioned and we repurpose them into smaller standalone systems, mid tier level that we distribute across South Africa and those other partner countries in the, the region and the square kilometer array. We're currently using four systems that have been repurposed and uh, two of them are from TAC, the Texas Advanced Computing Center, that's Ranger and Stampede. We have a system from Cambridge University and our own decommissioned predecessor HPC facility in South Africa, which has also been repurposed. My team at the moment consists of roughly 19 people, that's 18 plus myself, spread across the Advanced Computer Engineering Lab, our technical team at the Center for High Performance Computing. We also have research and academic support staff that assist these sites in running their code. And we have an operation support, obviously, because this is quite a large project. Just a snapshot of some of the deployments. I think this is fairly up to date, even though the data is 2022. Um, we, we're spread across many countries. At, at the moment, we have 17 sites internationally with systems, and we have roughly 17 sites locally in South Africa. The, the reason it's approximate is because there are some systems that are in transit. Uh, and based on that scale, I, have a snapshot here of the last couple of years of travel that I've had to do thanks to Google Maps. And it's scattered all across these regions here. And it's pretty intense for an individual to do all those trips. So when I'm 
running a project of the scale with a, a large team and I still have to do all these visits to sites for partner deployments or engagements and on top of that you know be a father and a husband it gets quite a lot so a typical approach to these site deployments would be the site readiness um, that we evaluate beforehand the main the main components there would be the infrastructure we need to make sure the sites are ready to receive the hardware we need to make sure that there's a user base to use the systems and we need to know that there's some technical and leadership support at the institutions to facilitate these systems when we deploy them so that's i'm not going to go into detail there but oh the slides are not updated but uh, what we're really looking for is a site to be ready but why do we have to wait for the site to be ready before we begin our training? So what we've actually started to do now is look at a model where we can train before the hardware has even reached the sites. So typically, we would build a system, have it ready sitting in our storage. A site would express interest. We'd, make, we'd do an evaluation remotely and sometimes go on site to do an assessment if they need assistance. We would facilitate the deployment and then we'd do on-site site training. And pre-COVID, that was the model. And that's why there was so much travel in the African region on that map that I showed you. But it's unsustainable for many reasons. Of course, a small team facilitating a large audience, but also what we found, and you've probably heard the expression, give a man a fish and you feed them for a day and you teach them to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. So I've developed my own expression that's similar to these uh, perversions over here. I've learned through the ecosystems project that if you, teach someone to fish, they tend to go fish in someone else's pond. And what I mean by that is you train them up, then they go get another job because they're marketable, because they have a scarce skill now, especially in Africa, and we lose that, that capital that we've invested in. So we cont continuously are repeating the training for newcomers to HPC at the same sites again and again. And it was unsustainable because we would travel to a site, spend a week or two there to do the training, make sure that they're ready, they can deploy their system, they can administer the system, we'd go and leave, they'd run the system for a couple of months, then we were told meet the new guy because the old guys left. And of course, just manpower and availability, that's not very practical. So around 2020, conveniently, I suppose, we had decided to move to online training to make it more sustainable. And in fact, what actually happened is I was working on a, a course in my master's called Educational Technology, and that happened as COVID hit. So one of our research projects that we well, that I chose to do was to develop the online training material, and I used that as my uh, project for Georgia Tech. So the timing was pretty convenient for us because as we started heading lockdown, our material was already online for the training. So it didn't really impact on getting the the outreach to the sites. Uh, but my my material that I did as a project, which has now evolved into much more was primarily around creating an open HPC virtual lab. That's the software stack that we use to run the systems and to develop HPC system administrator workshops. So that was the vision before COVID and then it kind of transitioned straight into a practical solution. Obviously the motivations for taking things online will differ, but for us, it was the lower overhead because we no longer had to fund participants to come to a central location because in Africa, a lot of the sites are resource constrained specifically financially so our department at the CHPC would fund a lot of this. Um, I actually see I'm using old slides here. It's got the old logos. So hopefully I don't miss anything important. But uh, logistics as well, we're not hosting a face-to-face -face workshop anymore. We're actually concentrating on uh, reducing the number of face-to-face -face events and still having the same impact. The workload could also be rerun re on demand. Um, we could do it relatively easy, just spawn another copy of the training and it was done. And in terms of scalability, we could also accommodate a larger audience now because when you do it on site, we're paying for people to visit to a specific central location that could get quite costly. And with frequency, we could also make it more accessible on demand. We didn't have to host a formal workshop for people to access the material. Some of the lessons that I learned from my own experience in Georgia Tech influenced the development of the content. And it actually violates one of the principles that I learned, but I'll explain that later. My, my experience gave the foundation for what we tried to do. And since then, we've evolved it a lot from user feedback, but we've, we harnessed the principles of accessibility, user-friendliness, flexibility, replayability, and compatibility. 
Um, what that really means is in, in Africa, particularly resources are very constrained. Some people don't have regular reliable internet. I mean, even in South Africa right now, we have an energy crisis. So even having access to a cloud system to do your, your training would be very difficult because power can go off up to, well, we were recently eight hours a day. Um, so for, for a myriad of reasons, we've had to kind of base our content development on principles like this. Another challenge we had was dropout and disengagement. That's an online experience. A lot of people tend to register, but for whatever other reason, can't proceed with the training. So we adopted uh, strategies to affect the reversal of that impact. So we'd have office hours, we'd encourage collaboration, we'd incentivize participation. You know, if you complete the course, you might get hardware sooner than a site that isn't ready. Well, of course that's the case, but you know, try to incentivize people to make sure that they are actually ready and they've ticked all the boxes. Um, yeah, and from, I guess one of the lessons that I learned running through power cuts, internet outages, we had a, an insurrection, well, riots in South Africa that were pretty dire at one point. And then I'm running my full-time job, managing my family during COVID lockdown, life just gets in the way. And so all the material we've developed, we've tried to make it as manageable and flexible as we can. And all the courses that we run are much longer than the actual workload requires. So we can accommodate a 15 hour hands-on workshop over two weeks that gives people more flexibility to attend to it when they need to but that comes with catches as well like sometimes you make the time too long people lose interest so it's an ongoing dynamic learning experience even for us as we develop it um, in terms of implementation one of the focuses on those principles was the, the videos we've made youtube videos so it's much more accessible because there are certain groups that actually zero rate youtube videos so they can download them without using up their personal data caps and of course, they're replayable, they're compatible across many devices, user-friendly yeah. interface, as far as yeah. most people know with YouTube. And uh, what ages are they? Uh, uh, Sam? Eight and six. Okay. TikTok is here in the US. If you're below the ages of, if you're below 13, you get a very restricted version of it. Is anyone else hearing the feedback? Okay. Yes, someone needs to be muted. Yeah, I think, I think they sorted it out. I'm not going to mention Sam's name. Um, and then, of course, flexibility. So it's on demand. You can repeat your play your playback whenever you want on YouTube. So you know, as a, as a tool, YouTube has proven fairly effective, and also it's given us more outreach because people can just stumble across our material on YouTube without us having to advertise it. Um, in terms of our virtual labs, we try to move away from cloud for many reasons. Uh, I think if you've done a cloud-based workshop before, you've discovered how many hours are spent troubleshooting the cloud. Even at a very uh, refined, polished event like SC, you can lose a couple of hours at a workshop or tutorial because there's a problem with the cloud. So we try to make all our content available offline. And what I mean by that is we're using a vagrant image with VirtualBox. You pull down the, the resources to your local machine. It can get quite large. So we've, we've accommodated that through distribution of USB flash drives, to, uh, you know, if the data is too, too much for a site to accommodate. But the idea is you can run all the virtual lab entirely offline. You don't need any internet connection at the worst case. Like I say, prepackaged everything for them as a resource pack first. Uh, otherwise, it's a hybrid experience where you pull down what you need on demand. And we've made it a low resource requirement. So we can actually run a very low spec virtual cluster on even a generic desktop or a generic laptop by today's standards. All our material is open source as well. People are welcome to steal it and repurpose it, but we encourage everyone to contribute and collaborate with us. Um, user-friendly is a personal you know, opinion, but I think it's user-friendly. And again, it is flexible because it's on demand. You can pull it down even outside of a formal workshop, but also what's really nice is that the content that you produce at the end, the working virtual cluster can be transferred to production with one or two minor tweaks. In terms of formal workshops, again, we do provide these quarterly, so if you miss one, generally you wait the next quarter and there's another workshop available. It's been accessed by people across the world, but our primary focus is of course Africa because that's our community that we focus on. And during the formal workshops, we, we tend to adopt a learning management system. And we also have a chat group on Slack. Uh, that, as I mentioned before, will run between one and two weeks and it's for about 15 hours of work. So depending on the audience, we can customize that. If we know that people have more dedicated time, 
we like to condense it down to one week so that we can get it done quickly. Um, and we played around with tools such as Piazza, which was my experience from Georgia Tech, and then EdStem. That's not to say that we only use those or that those are well received, but those are the ones that I'm familiar with and I found the experience quite useful in a class of a thousand uh, working at the pace of a Georgia Tech master's. So we, we are always open to using new tools. Um, then I guess I, I kind of skimmed over it because I want to give more time to questions and also for Benjamin. And what we have are resources that are currently available right now. So if you were to go to this link at the top here, you'd go to OpenHPC Introductory Virtual Lab. And at the time that I developed that during my Georgia Tech course, it appeared to be the first of its kind available as a virtual lab, particularly as an offline virtual lab. So there's a there's a, a nice document that we've developed there. Like I said, it's hosted on GitLab. And there's also videos on YouTube. So if you search for HPC Ecosystems 101, OpenHPC, that tag will bring you this playlist here, which is the start that you need to be able to deploy the system from the videos. We also have a Slack workspace. And if you want to join that, I've written a tiny URL that's valid for about 26 days before Slack deletes it. So you can join our ecosystems community there. Again, it's called ecosystems because it's focused on Southern Africa and the uh, SKA partner countries, but we have people from all over the world on that group. Um, likewise with the Google group, that's kind of our distribution channel for communicating via email. And if you're ever looking for a workshop, you can just keep an eye on events.chpc.ac.za, although we do communicate those announcements through the Google group and the ecosystem Slack. There's no project can achieve what it does or get anywhere without all these other role players and stakeholders. So I just want to acknowledge there's a lot of people out there. Um, they are very helpful in us reaching out to so many people and also for us having the hardware pipeline that we need to be able to deploy these systems. I thank you for your time and I will hand over to Benjamin and I'm always available for answering questions later and I just need to share the updated slide deck actually because this was not the updated slide deck but at least it, it saved some time. Thank you very much. All right, Benjamin, you want to go ahead and we'll have uh, questions for both of you at the end then? Sure, no, that, that's fine. <clears throat> uh, Brian, can you stop sharing? Yep. There you go. Okay. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. Yes, go ahead. Yep. Okay, great. So uh, good afternoon and good morning um, to everyone that has joined. Um, I'll be doing a uh, overview of the Coding Summer School 2023 um, that uh, happened earlier uh, this year. And you'll see this image um, you know, a few times in my slides just to give you an idea of the scale um, of our Coding Summer School. So this is, if you're not familiar, this is uh, South Africa, um, the different provinces or also states, for example, that um, in South Africa, and each uh, you'll see there's different uh, universities or institutes that all played a role and collaborated to be part of the Cutting Summer School. I'll go into this more a little bit later. Uh, you'll see this uh, picture a few times, but just to give you a bit of a scale of, of what we're uh, speaking about. All right, so um, again, the agenda for my discussion is uh, a bit of a history about the Cutting Summer School or CSS. Um, I'm going to look at uh, how it was, it was redesigned, uh, most, mostly due to COVID, um, and also looking at how this was a school of firsts. Uh, we're looking at um, a mini school a life cycle, uh, because this was a complete package end-to-end -end where we had to design everything um, from scratch and to make it uh, automated. We're going to look at the, um, the, the teams that were involved in, this, uh, in the Coding Summer School. So it included the CHPC team, which uh, I'll explain later, and the NITX team, so a collaboration between two teams or two organizations. Um, and then a brief overview of the student stats, uh, those that were actually enrolled. Um, I'll be looking at the hybrid learning stack, um, the tools that we used uh, for the Coding Summer School. Uh, I'll look at the school structure and, and timetable, and then the champions or the people that were represented, the venues or the universities, um, around the country. Uh, I'll look at 
two important features that um, that we implemented, which was automated marking and automated certification. Um, I'll briefly discuss prizes and very importantly, the feedback that we've got from um, uh, from students and from the organizers. And then uh, the monthly coding challenge, which is, which is a continuation um, of uh, the coding summer school. All right, I see this. Yeah, OK, all right. Something was in the chat, but let me carry on. Um, where's my pointer? There we go. Okay, so, okay, so a bit of a history of the Coding Summer School. So it's an annual event, um, and it's done in collaboration between the Center for High Performance Computing, as uh, Brian mentioned, as well as the National Institute for Theoretical and Computational Sciences, uh, NITEX. So this has been happening for about 13 years, um, and for the past five years, we've been collaborating with NITEX um, to do the Coding Summer School. So also before COVID, um, it was usually in person at a specific location. We would all travel there um, with average of 50 postgrad students, right? And the aim was to teach uh, postgrad students Python coding, um, Bash, uh, as well data science and computational skills, right? So that was the general, um, you know, aim of, of, of the school. So during COVID, this change, obviously everything went virtual um, and uh, all our content was um, catered for online students as well as our environment. Um, and we, for the past two years online, we got about 150 students that participated, which is pretty good and a lot more that uh, we had before. Um, Post COVID, we decided to extend the reach um, and decided to make it a hybrid and stream the live content at university lectures halls around the country. Where students would actually attend uh, physically as, as um, it's, I think we would agree to some um, point that, you know, attending physically anything, um, uh, there are many benefits to that. So um, our initial is estimate for this hybrid um, coding summer school was about 350 students and we're looking at about five university venues. Um, eventually we've got about 773 students and 29 universities participating. Um, so this was a huge scale um, up for us. And the first time we were dealing with this magnitude of students and institutes. So there was a lot of logistics and planning, as you can imagine, that, that went, in, went into this. So again, um, I, I tried to um, focus on the life cycle uh, for this end-to-end -end, um, mini school or coding summer school and required various levels to you know, properly execute it. Uh, so we had to again, just take a step back and look at needs assessment and design, how are we gonna design this um, to cater for the scale of students and being hybrid and, and everything else. Um, one thing that made it easy is that the content was pretty much done and dusted and uh, we've been uh, doing similar content for the past 13 years or so and refined each yeah, based on you know, the feedback we got. So that was a huge relief, but it was more the, the, the logistics of all the institutes, all the students and the scale that we needed to take care of, right? So this is where the planning um, stage, um, you know, was quite important. We started about three months um, before the actual event started, uh, which was actually uh, not enough time, but, you know, it, it, uh, we made it work. Um, and then we another important aspect is a marketing and recruitment re, re, recruit sorry recruitment um, where we're trying to get all the students and um, our NITEX partner um, did very well in getting you know all, of almost 800 students to participate and all 29 universities or research institutes to come on board and then finally well but not really actually it's the execution how um, all this work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it happens over two weeks. I'll just discuss a bit later, but the execution of the coding summer school, right? This was need to be planned as well, um, quite thoroughly to cater for the scale of students. Um, and lastly, and uh, very importantly, is monitoring and evaluation. So after we planned and designed everything um, and executed the coding summer school, we needed to monitor it on a on a day-to-day -day basis and evaluate how well were we actually um, presenting the content, how was the logistics um, revolved, and how was the technologies we used. So it was a lot of feedback we got and a lot of monitoring that was done um, throughout the whole um, two weeks of the Coding Summer School. 
So before I get into the, the details, I just want to look, uh, look at the, um, the, the two teams that were involved. So myself, Benjamin Bash, um, I was a lead coordinator and one of the, the lecturers for the Coding Summer School. Um, then we also have our research manager, Dr. Van Jensa van Rensburg, um, also the co-coordinator, um, Mr. Mateto Savaro, um, part of our core team, um, also one of the lecturers, Dr. Kevin Koval, also a senior advisor um, who has many years of um, teaching and um, online education and, and physical education as well. Um, and then Ms. Lara Tim as well, part of the core team, focus a lot on logistics, day-to-day -day items that need to be uh, done, as well as a bit of teaching as well. Um, Mr. Brian Johnson, um, which I'm sure you all know about, um, he was part of our Canvas team, focused on in infrastructure. Mr. Eugene DeBester, um, our Canvas team, focused on um, working with the Canvas API and automated marking. Um, was normally Mufupi, also pulled a card, Part of a core team um, focused on translation of, of content. I'll focus on that a bit later on. And Mrs. Mr. Sam Matecha uh, focused on automation of certificates. Right. So this is all the one team uh, that was part of the Coding Summer School. Um, the other team, which is um, our Nitex uh, team, um, consists of Prof. Francesco Puccioni, um, the coordinator and also the uh, lecturer. Ms. Rene Kotze, focused on logistics and marketing. Uh, Mr. Alawani Guga was focused on the venue and the champions for all the 29 institutes. Uh, Mr. Tikele Komalo um, was also focusing on, on the venue and, and, and the champions. And then the other lecturers we had was Prof. Uvo Yako, Dr. Graham Pleasance, and Dr. Ilya Sistinyaski. So I just wanted to give you a bit of brief um, overview of the team that was involved uh, for the scale of, um, of a mini school or a coding summer school. There were many aspects that, that were uh, part of it and I can see the large team that was involved to actually make it work. Okay. Um, so now I'm gonna get a bit into the details of the coding summer school. So the first thing I'm gonna speak about is a hybrid learning stack. So the first thing, um, which is quite important uh, decision to make was what LMS to use. So previously we were using um, Moodle for many years, uh, but due to some infrastructure issues, since we were hosting it locally, we decided to use Canvas and it, um, it found it proved itself to be um, very easy to use. It was free, scalable, uh, API friendly, and it was very, um, you know, easy to use on various levels for the teacher and for the student. So um, we got very good feedback from um, the organizers and the teachers and the students and just how a lot of Canvas worked. And just have to thank uh, Brian as well for being the uh, main Canvas guru and um, for promoting the idea of, of using Canvas. The next uh, learning stack tool uh, was Slack. So all communication was done via Slack. We um, we clearly specified no email communication uh, was allowed for, for anything related to the coding summer school. Everything was done by Slack. As you can imagine, trying to filter an answer like 700 students having um, you know login issues or you know they don't have uh, like uh, connection to the Canvas whatnot uh, is a huge nightmare. So Slack was the only form of communication. Um, and it worked very well. We, it's not the first time we have used Slack uh, in, in this way, uh, but it worked very well for collaboration between the champions, um, and the students and the staff in general and, and, and the organizers. Um, and also each venue had its own Slack channel and we'll discuss it a bit later. Uh, we use Zoom as well to stream, to, to stream all the uh, live lessons to all, all, all the venues. Um, and then just for internally, we use MS Planner to store the planning material, some documentation um, and, and guidelines and our designs have been used for the Coding Summer School and also to create and des designate tasks to the various um, you know, members of the team. And then also use GitLab just to store um, some of the material that notes, um, some of the code we use as well for the, um, for the, for the API automation. Um, and then I have a few uh, uh, pictures as well of our Canvas environment. 
So this is typically what it, um, our Canvas environment looked like. Um, our general module, we have a few modules, week one and, and week two. Um, I'm not going to go into too much details about this, just showing you what, what, it, uh, what it looked like. Um, and then our Slack. So this is typically what our uh, Slack workspace look, uh, looked like. Um, we had various channels. So our most important one was a general channel, which was for announcements only. So again, as I said, no email notifications were made, any, um, anything relevant for the students or organizers or anyone uh, was made in Slack via general and it was, it was read only. Uh, only admins could obviously um, post announcements. Um, and again, it was received very well. People responded to it. And you can see we had over 685 you know, people part of our Slack workspace. Um, and you can see as well that each, um, each venue that were part of it had their own Slack channel as well that they could, uh, that, that they could collaborate and ask questions and help each other out. And then importantly, we had our help channel. So let me just show you our help channel. Yeah, so our help channel is what we used um, during our live session. So again, um, uh, the how it worked was um, I was at a certain venue in at the University of Cape Town, and I there was students in front of me for, like uh, physically, and then there were students all around the country as well. About uh, about over, just over seven hundred. They were they all had um, uh, in a lecture hall, so there was a Zoom um, was streamed live on 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 a big projector screen and then um, to interact with you know all the students from around the country we use slack and typically we well we use this help channel and um, I would be giving a lesson um, and the way we structured the course was you know we had the notes the, the lecture notes which was a guide but the interaction between students um, was the focus and we let the students kind of guide the 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 lesson to some degree where I asked them you know give me like, you know, variable names and like send me data so I can play around with it. And so I, I try to make it as interactive as possible. And, and the students were very active on the help channel from all around the country, which, which was, which is very, uh, you know, uh, useful, uh, especially because so many people, people, so many people were online. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I, th I think that's the two images I wanted to show you regarding this um, slide. Okay. Generally the uh, school structure, um, it started the 30th of Jan um, from 9 to 4 um, and ended two weeks later on the 10th of Feb. Um, students were sent login details um, and access to the content a week before class started. Um, during this time, we expected them to familiarize themselves with Canvas and install the necessary software. Um, so we were teaching Python and that install, uh, that to install an anaconda and get familiar with it before class actually started on Monday. Um, and then as well as um, install Moby extern for the for, for the bash lessons. So this is typically um, some students did install the software in time, others didn't. Monday came, they were still struggling to log in, as you can expect students do. Um, so champion, so just to uh, clarify, a champion is just uh, the venue organizer. So each university um, in South Africa had a specific event or venue organizer, we call them champions. Um, they got access to all the notes a week before. Um, students got the day one notes on the 29th of Jan, so a day before, just to re review it. So, so previous and the previous day they they got um, you know notes for the following day. Um, and also, each institute had their own Slack channel. Um, students were expected to be on campus, um, and it's affected by load shedding. So, load shedding, if you're not aware of, um, South Africa has a power issue where um, for a few hours a day, um, uh, power is not, um, you know, we don't have power, put it, put it uh, uh, that way. So some areas of the country are uh, affected more than others. Um, for example, in, in the Western Cape, we might get like two hours of load shedding, where two, two hours, certain parts of the, of the uh, province or state, for, for example, which is, um, put it this way, a few suburbs might not have power. Um, for two hours. So that's something, um, you know, we had to work around. Um, but, you know, uh, 
most most institutes and universities have backup power, so that's why we encourage them to be at, at these institutes so they can you know still have power and access the the live sessions. Um, also, all students are expected to be on Zoom if they're online, for for, for example. Um, we also had tutorial sessions where students ask questions, they do quizzes, um, and can interact with each other. Um, uh, primarily, students um, only ask questions on Slack, so we can record it because, as you're aware of asking questions on Zoom, you can't, you know, once your Zoom session is over, you know, the discussion is gone, whereas in Slack, it's always there. Um, and students, very importantly, are expected to install software on their own laptops and PCs. Um, so as part of the learning exercise, um, some uh, universities didn't have that, or some students didn't have their own PCs, for example, or laptops. So we gave browser options due to some restrictions um, for installing software. All right, um, and again, this is uh, just a brief, uh, this is overview of the timetable. So this is, um, you know, each half an hour breakdown of what happened for week one, for example. So um, from Monday to, to Friday. Um, so, so Monday was introduction to uh, Python basics. Um, and then the following days just got more, uh, more um, intense. Um, the key um, outcome for Python was really to teach data science um, uh, skills and tools. So focus on uh, pandas was a huge uh, focus of uh, Python these Python lessons and many students really benefited. So we looked at data visualization as well um, and various ways uh, to visualize your data. Um, just note that we had a broad uh, you know, range of uh, domain areas. I'll show that a bit later. Um, so it was important for to have a common um, goal for teaching Python. We also um, later in the um, in the week, uh, we focused on uh, introduction to Linux and Bash scripting, and this was uh, typically for um, students uh, that would be using uh, our cluster and want to know a bit more about HPC. All right, so that was week one. Uh, week two focused more on um, advanced applications of, of Python, uh, computational um, uh, or theoretical and computational uh, applications. So introduction to SymPy, uh, probability and, st and stats, um, ODEs or ordinary differential equations and, and machine learning. Um, so this was more advanced uh, topics that were that were covered in, in week two. Um, there was a bit of a, um, uh, a, a break in the normal uh, you know day-to-day -day lessons, which was called special topics or, or STEM talks. So for half an hour, we got senior research, senior researchers to discuss the research research data domains in HPC or STEM one related fields. Um, so we had a variety of speakers um, that, that could speak in various domains, which students really appreciated, um, just to see how you know it can be applied um, in various fields. So these were just um, a few of the well, all the um, speakers that uh, spoke. You can see Brian spoke about HPC ecosystems as well. Um, yeah, so looking at what about student stats? So this is um, a breakdown of some of the universities um, that took part. So we also had a, a large contingent of students outside of South Africa. So about 55 students joined. So I think um, it was from Kenya, um, uh, Joma Kenyatta, University, as far as I can remember, had quite a large cohort of students, um, and then various other universities. Um, so we had, um, you know, some universities on average about forty students uh, registered. Um, others, you know, then were smaller universities, and I had two or three students that 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 joined. So practically, um, so these were the this was, this was before students actually. Uh, join this is just registration sorry registration details so um practically uh there were 29 institutes um there were there were 25 that actually had students um and amount of students that actually partook in total was about 550 
Um, so that was the actual physical number that students that actually did uh, partake. All right, um, an important outcome as well, um, you know, for coding summer school, especially in Africa and, and South Africa, is that um, English shouldn't be the only language um, that coding or data science should be instructed. You know, majority of you know South Africans, their first language isn't uh, English. So one of the outcomes of the coding summer school was to translate um, the content into one of the official uh, languages of South Africa, which was Isitwasa. Um, so had about a 16 percent um, 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 amount of uh, students that you know speak Isitwasa as a second language, or sorry, as a first language was about 16 percent. Uh, why we chose Isitwasa was uh, because of the um, uh, you know, my colleagues uh, support language as well. My colleagues were able to speak that language, so we, we, we could support it. Um, our plan is to actually translate uh, our content into the other languages um, in preparation for the Coding Sum School 2024. So our plan is to uh, focus um, on providing, you know, the content in various other languages. Okay, um, quite importantly, is the domain areas. Again, we had a variety of domain areas that partook um, in the coding summer school, um, primarily dominated by physics, chemistry, computer science, um, IT, but we had people from, the students from accounting, agriculture, astrophysics, uh, microbiology, the medical field. So we had a huge cohort of students from various fields. Um, so it was very interesting to actually engage with them and see how you know Python can actually help them and. I, again, the um, the primary um, benefit for them was learning about data science skills and, and pandas, um, which was something we'll be um, evaluated and will focus more on in um, in the next coding summer school in 2024. Um, why I take the course? So this is a bit of feedback. So um, this this is quite um, well distributed uh, between learning about HPC, then uh, learning about data science, Python, Linux. Help with the research, um, so but if, it's good to know why students are taking the the coding or, or doing the coding summer school. Um, also, importantly, um, uh, to find out you know how you know while students um, know different languages or even Python themselves. So, a half of those that actually registered actually knew Python, um, and I asked other questions like, "What libraries do you know?" Um, and most were familiar with or from the pandas and um, and like machine learning libraries, for, for, for example. So they were actually quite familiar with Python, but they wanted to advance their skills. Um, and that's why they joined. Um, so quite a large percentage, um, close to 50 percent didn't know Python. Or as you can see, um, almost 200 students use spreadsheets only for um, for their academic research, which is quite surprising. Um, and hopefully, well, mo most students that spoke to me that, you know, um, about this found that, you know, they can definitely improve their performance and efficiency, um, you know, um, by using Python rather than the, than using spreadsheets. Um, spreadsheets are useful. I use it as well, but I mean, um, it has its limitations. Um, yeah, so it's a last, you know, bit of a... Uh, um, Funny thing to show is uh, I asked them, but about who, what superhero would they choose? So it seemed Iron Man, Spider Man, Wonder Woman, Batman, or Superman um, are the most popular superheroes. I've got a variety of other superheroes I've never heard of. Um, some said themselves, as, and and um, or their mother or their grandmother and, and whatnot. So um, it's useful to take note that some superheroes have certain uh, temperaments and characteristics that you can also you know you know. Um, see in people. Okay, so um, that was some student stats, and I'll I wanted to look at um, the champions and venue logistics. So again, champions are just the venue organizers. So the roles were typically to arrange a venue location, uh, had should enough have enough seating, stable internet, uh, power during load shedding if possible, a, a, a projector screen, um, and um, uh, to contact to contact students, so um, students would register on uh, a CHPC event site, 
and then I would um, send the uh, the champions, uh, the students that they need to contact and um, make sure they will actually attend and you know discuss with them the logistics. Um, also, we arrange for meals for students. So this was um, uh, sponsored by Netix and CHPC, um, like 50 rand per student per day. So um, I think it's probably about like $8, I think. Um, I could be mistaken. Um, yeah, so per student per day. So that's like just really a, a snack and they had coffee and tea ready at, at the universities. Um, and if possible, arrange for, for tutors to help during tutorial sessions. Um, so this was one aspect of the coding summer school at, at the venues that was lacking. Um, having more students um, each day would have definitely helped just for at just at the physical venue. Um, so we didn't have in, in, enough for that, but that's just comes down to planning. And uh, but that's definitely an important aspect for dealing with the scale of, with the scale of, of students. Um, Okay, um, almost done. So uh, a useful feature um, looking at the life cycle of this coding summer school is, you know, you have to somehow assess the student's ability of how well did they learn. Um, so we had quizzes, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, but also had uh, assignments that, that they had to do um, at the end of the two weeks, just to assess, you know, on their own, how well did they um, understand the content. Um, so we had a Python assignment and a bash assignment and just imagine we had 553 um, students um, those that actually had it in the assignment was about 350 so just imagine marking uh, 350 python assignments so it, it's a python file right that needs to run um, and you know give certain outputs um, so 350 python 350 bash Assignments that 700, you know, files you have to physically mark, which is ridiculous to do. Um, so um, we decided to look at automated, sorry, uh, way to automate the, the marking. And Canvas has an excellent API, good documentation. And um, my, my colleague, uh, Eugene DeVesta, he was able to, um, you know, you know, get all the assignments that were uploaded. Uh, run a Python script to to mark um, the the files and, and outputs, and then um, upload the mark to, to to Canvas so students would 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 know it. So um, it took like you know a few minutes for the actual process to to happen um, to mark about seven hundred uh, scripts, which you know was just fantastic. Um, and then uh, I mean. A very important aspect is also uh, certification, right? So um, we had about, um, we had two types of certificates. One was those that just attended, uh, or attendance certificate, and the other one was for um, successfully completed. So in total, there were about 350 certificates um, that, needed to be, that needed to be uh, generated. Um, by attended, they had to, um, you know, attend about eighty percent of the um, uh, of the lessons that didn't complete certain amount of quizzes as well. So there were certain criteria. So at the end of it, only three hundred fifty certificates needed to be um, created. So again, um, you know, manually creating that. You know, each person has this, their own name. We added their mark as well that they got this to, to, to their certificate. So my colleague Sam Matecha, he um, used a tool called Glabel to. Uh, oh, yeah. The certificate, and um, which which read in um, the person's name and mark, um, and um, to the uh, to the application, and they created you know the um, the all the all the certificates, and then a Python script to um, uh, split those up because I think it prints it as one p one PDF, and then uh, another Python script that connected to Outlook that could send. Um, all the students um, an individual email with the individual uh, certificate. Um, it's 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 uh, might sound trivial, but the process is quite complex, and um, it was well executed. So, um, bye, bye Sam. All right, and yeah. So, the last thing is the prizes. So we had five hundred rand exclusive books 
gift voucher per winner. So exclusive books um, is a, uh, a well-known bookshop in South Africa. Can't remember the name of um, uh, of a bookshop. What's what's called in America? It's quite a popular one. Um, it, I was there a few years ago, but I can't remember the name of it. But um, but yeah, so the, the categories were the three most active students on Slack. So we recorded how active students were, like the questions and um, the comments and the posts that they made. So we monitored that. Um, the top 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 two champion prizes so how active how active the venues were, um, how, how active the, um, the the champions were with you know in in the Slack channel and at at, at the venue, and the top three quiz marks as well. Um, yeah, and then the, so the feedback uh, that we got from students again, so about 570 were actually on Slack, um, 550 were on Canvas um, that, were, that were actual st students. Um, roughly, we had 250 uh, students on Zoom per day. Just note that most were at the actual venue. So these are more for online cases. Um, we, have, we had a 90% approval of the tech tools we used that included Canvas and Slack. Um, interestingly, 50% of students attended at the venue and actually find, found being at the venue far better learning experience than learning online. Um, and generally, the, the content was well received. Um, again, physical attendance was, was preferred. Um, one downside was we should have had more tutors um, at, at, at the venues itself. Okay, so, um, and we got good feedback. So we got feedback from the students for week one and week two and from the champions. So again, um, if you remember in the beginning of the, um, of, of, these, of the presentation, I spoke about um, monitoring and evaluation. So we got pretty good feedback from students, but 240 students uh, replied, um, which is a very, very good representation of, you know, how well, um, you know, the feedback was for the Coding Summer School and also got feedback from week two and from the champions themselves. Um, just some insights as well. This was focused to be an intensive course. Um, students are introduced to tools and concepts that they can use for, for, for their research. It wasn't meant to be fully comprehensive. We just give them you know, a, a bit of insight of Python and tools that, that you can use, and then they need to go you know, themselves to actually research further what, what they will actually use. Um, the focus for universities is to you know, do something more comprehensive. So that's something um, students asked and you know, a dis discussion we had with the other universities like, uh, you know, what is the um, mandate for the coding summer school? And these were the things that we uh, will try to, to uh, stick to. Um, also the two week period seems a good, you know, time period to use. Um, and the timing during the year sometimes is a bit tricky because not all the, all the universities um, start at the same time. So typically we chose a time, um, a beginning of the academic year, um, just before re registration started. So usually, usually postgrad students are already on campus um, and they have a bit of time before actually, you know, the undergrad starts. So at times seem to work quite well. And also we try to stick to um, uh, this feedback we got from the, the, the champions is um, smaller groups is obviously better. So between 20 to 30 students per venue is something we will stick to in the future as well. Um, so after the two weeks, what happens? So um, uh, so we have a monthly coding challenge. So just to continue on the learning for, for students, um, we have um, a month later, we have a, a challenge which is primarily consists of a you know, Python data science assignment that they have to do. Um, and we have a Zoom session where we you know, um, you know, discuss it and then they get a month, a month to, you know, uh, do the assignment and then the following month we will have another zoom session to discuss it so this is just a way just to continue on the um the learning process following on from the coding summer school and this happens um until our, our winter school and a winter school focuses on um hpc all right so just to summarize um you know this was a school of first in south africa 
um, I would say in Africa as well, uh, the collaboration of 29 research institutes, uh, mostly universities um, in, in South Africa. Uh, there were outside ins institutes as well um, that were, you know, that took part. We had uh, almost 800 students that, that, uh, that did register. Um, our coded content was translated to its class for the first time, which is the first time in South Africa this has been done, um, which is a great achievement. And we had a diverse group of domain areas from like for, from uh, people from the medical field, accounting to physics, uh, computer science that, that took part. All right, and just to end off, um, this is a bit of a slideshow of all the venues and the, and the students that actually took part. So this is the last thing. Thank you. Well, th thank you both for your presentation. I see there are a few questions that uh, were put into the chat. So if you have other questions, you can put them there or you could unmute and ask them. Uh, one question was uh, about the location of the materials uh, on GitHub. And I think, uh, I think Brian already answered that in the chat. And the other question was, uh, most of the students are primarily graduate students? And the answer was that, that they, yes, they're mostly, uh, uh, there are uh, maybe a few undergraduates, but are there other questions that people would like to ask? I, I have a couple. Okay. Hey, yeah, so I'm, I'm Alex Feltis, I'm from Clemson University in the Southeastern United States. Um, and I do a lot of this kind of training from, I'm a computational biologist is where I'm coming from with the, these questions, but, so what what's up with so a lot of times when you're uh, accessing I guess for both both speakers when you're accessing you know these systems and you have to have a stable SSH connection and you have load shedding um, so you know how how much of an impact is that on being able to just like you know trying to do command line work on a remote system even if it's right across the room um, maybe I'll start there so. We typically have sites that have some sort of backup power with a small UPS. And uh, as far as the ecosystems project goes, we encourage everyone to use terminal multiplexes so that if a connection drops, they can just resume it once the power's back. Um, but that's also why we've tried to obviate that problem by using offline virtual lab with Vagrant. 
uh, the production level side of things are a bit different, obviously, because uh, when I deploy systems across Africa, a lot of people do talk about the backup power for their systems. And I actually say it's not worth it to for them to pay the amount of money that they're going to have to pay to get the resources to power a system. Yeah. But in terms of interruption, it can be negligible. Uh, we're pretty well adapted to the loss of power, which is a sad accolade to have, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, that, the, if I wrote for my um, May, so a lot of times that I, so I, when I teach my students how to do stuff, they, especially computer scientists, they always develop on their laptops and then they move over to HPC and then all their, their troubleshooting begins, like re, again, re, begins anew because <laughs> things don't always work on the same way on a laptop as on a HPC system. So do you see that problem a lot? Where, especially, I guess, more for you, Brian, like when you're training people how to do HPC stuff, and then if they're doing it locally, do they, you know, it doesn't always translate or the tra the skills still translate, right? But then you have to go redo it again. Do you see that problem too, or is it just me? Um, I can say that I've learned a lot. Uh, I, like I had a revelation actually at the end of last year that the training approach that we followed didn't work because a lot of the people we're dealing with actually, the, they don't even understand what we've taught them up to this point. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. We're trying to black box systems now and do hands-on learning as you go. But yes, previously, if we taught them on the Vagrant cluster, the, the software stack experience was the same as the physical. And yeah. typically we would package the systems so there wouldn't generally be any hardware failures. It would be the software failures that they would have experienced in the labs. And do they, what about like, I mean, networking is always, you know, rears yeah. its ugly head right when you're on a connected system especially like do, does that do that are they getting the network training they need to run the systems or are they just yeah, have are they, get, are they are they have enough skills to figure it out i guess is my question it's a mixed bag across the entire group right yeah. so we've learned that actually a lot of the sites think as a free hpc let's just take it because it's free and then they don't have the right people for that right so we are trying as far as possible to black box the systems that they don't require any hands-on intervention at that level and then we can hopefully train them as those problems arise. But um, yeah, it is it is difficult. Uh, some some of them can learn it on their own. That's why we rely heavily on the Slack workspace in our experience because then they right. can harness each other's help. Um, but our typical model for me would be we do a site visit, assess the staff, uh, kind of like you know just one on one. We would send the black box system and then follow up a couple of months later if they have a, a, a like a drastic hardware failure that they can't that we can't help troubleshoot remotely gotcha so you're you're having to maintain i mean you're building a, a support network too right i mean people can yeah. go in and fix this that's huge okay well thank you so much this is, a fan, this, this is the best seminar i've seen in a long time i just say that this is like every every nugget was well well received by me thanks Alex, this is Julie Mullen. I was going to say we have the same problem. Um, so we've always run an interactive supercomputing center. So we're a little bit different than um, a number of the true HPC MPI based centers. Um, and with the large variety of people that we have um, bringing problems, what we're finding is students are building on their laptops and those tools are fundamentally in conflict with an HPC system. And we almost have to retrain them. Um, and they are used to be able to like, well, I mean, how many people come and say, I need root? It's like, uh, no. Um, so they <laughs> even just understanding this idea. We, I mean, we start with what is a, what does it mean to have a shared system? Right. Because they don't understand that basic. Right. Um, so we've put together a course because we've set up how you submit jobs. We have a different way of thinking about that. Um, and so I can send you, if you I can send you, um, a link to our online course. We have an online open course that you can take. It, it It's pretty uh, basic. There's some part that's specifically to our system, but you can sort of see how we train them up. We've gotten a lot of really good feedback on from that from that course. Eat from people who have used other systems. They're like, I get it now. So um, I think this is something that, that the community is just coming to terms with, this idea that the tools that people are using, particularly for data science, don't translate well, and we need to we need to do some translation and some training to, to cover that gap. You know, if I just, it's the data set size too. I mean, I, I do genomics work, and so 
one file might not even fit on your laptop, let alone be able to process it. So once you move over to data right. intensive computing, then you have a whole nother bag of troubleshooting, right? But I'm sorry, can I ask where you, you're, I see you're outside, you're in a lovely place, but where? I'm, where I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not actually outside. This is, but our system is run by this river. So we don't, you, we don't have those power issues with our system because as long as, well, as long as we have rain, which we didn't have last year, we're good. Um, so I'm at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, but right now okay. I'm in, I'm in a big, big echoey space at MIT on campus at MIT. Um, I'll put my I'll put my email in the chat, and you can reach out to me, and I can point to you at our thank you our practical. It's a practical HPC system, a practical HPC course, and it's open to everybody. I will just put it into the chat. Thank you. You just got. Yeah. Hey, are you enjoying James Cuff? <sighs> My enjoying James. Cuff? Oh. <laughs> um, yes, I just, I just, I was just seeing him the other day. So that's our camp, our campus system. We have a campus system. We have a system gotcha. at the laboratory, and, and James is connected with the Office of Research Computing and Data. So then again, the whole issue of like, not just one big wad of data. How do you deal with data? That's become part of our training. Also, I didn't. I was going to ask about that. Do you guys? Uh, so, uh, Ben Benjamin, where did you go? Um, I was going to ask you whether or not you are covering like how to handle data, like best practices, better practices. Um, so that focuses more, I guess, on our winter school where we focus on HPC. Um, the um, our summer school is is actually for like we cater for students that have no experience in coding, so starting from scratch. Um, so as you can see, the numbers were like like fifty percent had no coding experience before. But um, what we found is students generally want, um, you know, insight into data science, uh, understanding, you know, large data, how do you handle large data, what is large data, um, and, and handling different types of data. So it's something we will cater, um, you know, next, for our next coding summer school. Um, but that topic specifically is covered more so in, in our winter school when we discuss, you know, what or do training for HPC. The other thing I'm seeing here, um, both someone from um, uh, from Harvard and then also working with the library. So this is done through the libraries. It's like teaching researchers then when you'll get them when they're brand new and teaching them how to use or what the rules are for data. Like, what do you, how do you have to handle it? How do you have to protect it? How do you, and so that starts. In, and so we've been thinking of adding that into our like early session introduction for for people who will be using our system. So not only do they have like the, the file system issues, but that they have this other understanding of, you know, what data, what the laws and regulations are around data, because that's another important, becoming a more important piece. So I'm curious uh, if I other people are doing that. I would actually like to ask um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kevin Kovo, um, if if he is able, if he has his mic, um, he has um, from interesting insights into, uh, students and data and, and large data and dealing with data. Um, I'm not sure if we can, because uh, we've spoken about before, but um, he's well versed in this topic. So maybe if we can give, give some insight. Uh, thank you, Benjamin. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yes. Okay, thank you. So we see because uh, the intention with the winter school in particular is to prepare uh, postgraduate students in science and engineering to use high performance computing and specifically uh, our cluster at the center for high performance computing uh, effectively. Uh, that means that they're able to translate their scientific workflow into a job script uh, that can really take good advantage of the hardware so that there is a, a, a you know efficiency in mind as, as well as scalability. Uh, now Specifically in the case of big data, what we see amongst our research students and our researchers is uh, two classes of big data users who come to us. Um, it's those who have uh, very large input data. Uh, so typically uh, image processing of various types, whether it be astronomy or medical or similar, uh, and also the machine learning. Uh, those, in order to train a machine learning model effectively, you do need to feed it a lot of data. 
the second class are those that produce a lot of data from the results. And, and, and that tends to be the classical HPC simulation type. Uh, weather forecasting, for example, produces quite a bit of output data. And if you are looking at climate studies, then you're doing your weather forecasting over a much uh, larger scale in order to get some idea. Uh, I mean, you're not just looking at, say, next 10 days, you're looking at the next uh, 10 to 50 years, and, and that may require uh, going through quite a lot of parameters uh, and, and different scenarios. And, and that also applies to some of the um, uh, increased use of machine learning to help with uh, parameter search uh, for simulation, the sort of hybrid modeling uh, approach as well. So th those are generally the two classes, large input data, large output data. Uh, now, how we handle it is basically our cluster has a very large file, a luster file system, parallel file system, uh, and, and, and that gets used. Uh, we have limits with that. Obviously, we're trying to move on to a hierarchical file system where people can not need to keep so much data in hand. Now, teaching students how to manage data is not something that we've yet added, though we very much would like to. Uh, in the winter school, we find we need to first get them through the basics of working with a job script, understanding what a cluster or the parallel hardware they're targeting, like GPUs, can really do, just to use it effectively. Uh, so those are more the uh, beginner type students, uh, but definitely what we would consider the two essential intermediate topics that should follow on from that is big data, it is just data management, sorry, in general, and visualization. So those would be our next two topics uh, for future schools, which would follow on from uh, something like the winter school. Uh, thanks, I, I've rambled a bit, but I hope that answers your question and gives you some context from our experience. Yes, thank you. Are there any other questions? Well, if not, I'd like to again to thank the speakers. I think this was an excellent uh, webinar. And uh, thank you all for attending. And this will uh, be on the uh, SIG HPC Education YouTube channel in a day or so. And also uh, we'll post the, uh, the, the chat and the uh, slides. Uh, so Benjamin, send, send me a copy of your slides if you would. And yeah. Brian, make sure I have the updated set before I post those. Where will you post these? Uh, the, the links will be posted on the SIG HPC Education website. Um, SIG HPC. SIGHPEducation.acm.org. And uh, they should be up in, let's say, in a few days. I, I don't want to promise too soon. So thanks again to the speakers and all those attending. And everyone have a good rest of your day, however long that is. I think we lost Steve. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That was great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.